You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. If God is peeking through all that by the Holy Spirit and He's saying, listen, you need to repent of your sin and believe in me and follow me, do it. Don't put it off. You don't have the guarantee of tomorrow. None of us do. But today you can. Today you can have new life in Christ and have a whole new beginning. You go, why did I put that off for so long? Right? We had a gentleman up here who got baptized, right? I don't know how old he is, but you know he's at least in his 50s, 60s, I don't know. And he said, I've heard you on the voice, man. I'm following Jesus. That's what it's all about. Once you give your life to Christ, you have a hope for eternity that nothing can take away. He gives you a new heart and will start to move in your life when you're actively seeking Him. Today, Pastor Ron's going to remind you that your focus needs to stay on Jesus once you make that decision. The world will try to distract you with all sorts of temptations and lies, but God will give you the strength you need to say no to all of it. Is your heart completely sold out to God and following His calling for you? Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of John chapter 3 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. In the final analysis, I cannot affect the breadth of my ministry. What I can affect is the depth of my ministry. I can affect me. I can be more of a man of prayer, more of a man of God, seeking to please God more. That I can affect. That I could change me and Lord use me. And you can do that too. In any area that God has called you, you can't affect the breadth, but you can affect the depth. And I find that the deeper you go, the more effective you will be. The tragedy is when we try to do things in our flesh. The fact is, if God isn't in it, then just trust him. So the problem is we see other people being used by God, and we, I wish I had that. I wish he was using me like that. And we get jealous. So think about this. Here were the disciples of John coming to John. Look what's happening to Jesus. People are following Jesus. And you know what they were hoping? They were hoping that John was going to agree with them. That's why they did it. Oh, you're right, you know. That's what they were hoping. This is very similar to what happened to Moses. We find this in the book of Numbers. So Numbers chapter 11 God had raised up 70 other elders, leaders, to help Moses. I'll use these guys to help you, and you can work with them. And I want to put my spirit on them. And so the Lord took his spirit that was on them and placed them upon these 70 elders. And it says, when the spirit of God came upon them, they prophesied, though they never did it before. It was a way of identifying, these are the men, these 70 men. It says, they prophesied outside of the camp except for two men. They prophesied inside of the camp. And a young man ran up to Moses and said, hey, these two guys are prophesying inside the camp. It was Joshua, Moses' assistant, the guy who would be the next leader. He said, Moses, forbid them. They shouldn't be doing They need to do what everybody else is doing kind of a thing. And Moses said to Joshua, are you zealous for my sake? Are you really concerned about this? Or is there jealousy going on? Are you jealous that God has identified these guys and using them? He went on to say, oh, that all of God's people would have the spirit of God. Moses was not jealous or threatened at all by God using other people. Joshua was at that time. And that's what we see in John the Baptist's disciples here. They're jealous. They're telling John, people are following Jesus. And listen, John could have fallen into that trap very easily. John could have felt neglected. John could have felt forgotten. I mean, with all that John had done, I mean, John started the thing as the forerunner. He's the one that got thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people coming from all Judea, Jerusalem, and all surrounding areas to come and hear but John would have nothing to do with it. John is a humble man. I read a true story about a pastor in the United States, and this was several years ago. And at one time, he had a very popular church, a very large church, a very thriving church. But as the years, as the decades passed on, the church began to dwindle. It began to, you know, lose its quote-unquote membership. And there was a new young pastor that had moved into the area and was attracting crowds. And it was very obvious that God's hand was upon him. And so one Sunday evening, as the older church was meeting, the pastor noticed that hardly anyone was attending. It was in a church this size and, you know, three or four people. And everybody was down the street worshiping there. And so this elderly pastor looked at his little flock and said, you know what? Why don't we just all pack up and see what the Lord is doing over there? It's obvious God is working. I read that, I thought, man, what a humble man. Just willing to say, it's not about me, it's it's about Jesus. No envy, no jealousy. And so think about this. If God so blesses to use somebody else more than us, praise the Lord. If God uses us for a while and then diminishes it, praise the Lord. 
John found his joy in attracting others to Jesus. Christ be glorified, that's all that matters. That's all that should matter to us. So moving on in verse 28, John says to his disciples, you yourselves bear witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. In other words, I told you when I gathered to you to myself and I began this ministry, it's not about me, it's about Jesus. He never wanted to point people to himself. And by the way, that is the greatest mark of any ministry, that they don't point people to themselves, but to Jesus. And this is what amazes me when churches name their churches after their name or after their ministry. Honestly, I don't get that. Obviously, people in the body of Christ get it because they support it and they attend it. I don't get that personally because it's not about a personality or an individual. It's about Jesus. I've told you this before, and you might enjoy this, you might not, but it's been said you can tell how popular a church is by how many people attend on a Sunday. There's a lot of popular churches around here in our area for sure. You can tell how popular a pastor is by how many people attend a midweek service. Well, I'm not that popular. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but here's the clincher. And then the saying goes, you can tell how popular Jesus is by how many people attend a prayer meeting. So think about that. And all of those are good, and that's not a condemnation to any of us, but the reality is when we're on fire for Jesus, it's all, everything. Anyway, John wasn't you know, into attracting people to himself but Jesus, and he says in verse 29, we saw it in the beginning, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And again, everyone would have understood John's statement God declared himself the husband of Israel. He declared Israel his bride. And so as John refers himself as to the friend of the bridegroom, what he's saying is, I'm the best man. I'm the best man. Now, the best man in a Jewish wedding was called the Shoshben, the Shoshben. And he played an important role. He was the liaison between the bride and the groom. He was very involved in the preparations of the wedding, so kind of like a wedding coordinator, but not so much later on. But he was very involved. On the wedding day, though, what he did is he had one specific role. When he heard the voice of the bridegroom coming, right? When he heard the voice of the groom on his way, and what his job would be is now he opens the chamber for the bride, he introduces them, and he places them hand in hand as they then go underneath the canopy to be married by the rabbi. And so once the bride and groom are hand in hand, guess what? His job is complete. He doesn't begrudge the, the groom because I'm not getting married, you know. He's not upset because I didn't get to play a greater role. No, the Shoshben is completely content to assess, assist in the wedding to make sure the bride and the groom come together. And so what John is saying here is, I'm the Shoshben. I've stood, I've heard the voice of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. I've pointed him in the direction. I've pointed people to be his bride, to be wed to him in faith. I've done my job, mission accomplished. He says that at the end of verse 29, this joy of mine is fulfilled, mission accomplished. He was happy, Christ is honored. And that's the way it should be for us. It should all be about Christ being honored, Christ being glorified, Christ being praised. He takes center stage, not me, not us, not we. It's all him. And again, as I said, too many people want to draw attention to themselves. Sometimes we like to do that when we serve. Look at I did this for the Lord, I did this. I always like to tell people that say how great they are, say lift up your right hand, right? and put it right over here. Why? Now pat yourself on the back. Good job. You know, that's it. I want to hear from Jesus. Well done, good and faithful servant. I want to be a faithful servant. I want to be more of that. I want to be less of me and more of him, that's for sure. But it's all about him. I was reading about uh, a pastor in Australia, and he had a great speaker. This was many years ago. It was Jay Hudson Taylor. He was the founder of the China Inland Mission many years ago, and he had done so many great things. Read, he has many biographies out there on him and even several autobiographies. But anyway, he introduced Jay Hudson Taylor with all these superlatives, using the word great. He great this, great that. And we understand when we introduce somebody that's of great significance, kind of poured it on. But here's what Jay Hudson Taylor said as he entered the pulpit. His first words, he said, dear friends, I am a little servant of an illustrious master. <laughs> he just put it all there. It's all about Jesus. In fact, that's what John says in verse 30. Look at it. He must increase, I must decrease. 
As Jesus comes on the scene, he's telling his disciples, he shines. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. And listen, if the greatest prophet who ever lived said that, and that's what Jesus said of John the Baptist, then shouldn't we listen and shouldn't we take our cues from him? It's all about Jesus. I was just thinking about various missionaries that I've read, and you know, I love reading the old missionaries, good stuff. You know, Dio, uh, Moody, of course, not so old, pastor in the United States, but J. Hudson Taylor. You give me another one, William Carey. William Carey is known as the father of missions. In the late 1700s, coming out of England, he was a very poor man, self-educated, went to India. And there in India, he translated the Bible. This is one man working with a team of guys, of course, over a period of time. But he he translated the Bible into 40 languages and dialects. It would be something for one person to do one language. He did 40. He established several universities. He led a lot of people out of paganism. He turned, really, India right side up to hear the gospel for the very first time. As he was dying, this is what I want you to As he was dying, this is what he told his friend. These were his dying words. When I am gone, do not talk about William Carey. Talk about William Carey's savior. And he went to be with Jesus. <laughs> That's astounding. Astounding. Let me give you another one. And you maybe would be familiar with some of these names. George Whitfield, again, from England, was an open-air preacher. So he was one of the first evangelists. And listen to this. In the late 1700s, he himself would preach to crowds upwards to 30,000. That's before microphones. Can you imagine that? It was George Whitfield who actually, actually introduced two young men. Their names were John and Charles Wesley. You ever heard of those guys? Sing a lot of hymns from them. Uh, they started what is called the Methodist movement. Well, he led these guys and discipled these guys, and those two boys, guys, wanted to start a denomination. Whitfield was the one discipling him, and he stepped aside as a leader. And this is what he wrote. I have no party to be ahead of. And through God's grace, I will have none. But as much as lies within me, I will strengthen the hands of all denominations that preach Jesus Christ. All of his followers said, no, we want you to lead this thing. We want you to do it. He said, let my name be forgotten. Let me be trodden under the foot of all men if Jesus be glorified. Let us look above names and parties and denominations. Let Christ be our all in all. I care not who is uppermost. I know my place. And that's to be a servant of all. Man, when I read... The language of these men, these are the kind of men we wish we had in pulpits in the world today, but we don't. So here's John. He's a man of great humility. In 1 Peter 5, 5, this is what we read about us, ladies and gentlemen. It says, as Christians, be clothed in humility. We should clothe ourselves in humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That was the spirit of John. So we see this hindrance, and John moves in with humility. Beyond that, he moves to the place of honoring Jesus in verses 31 to 35. He continues, he who comes from above is above all, and he who is of earth is earthly and speaks from the earth, but he who comes from heaven is above all. So John is seeking to glorify Christ. He says, I'm earthly. What I say is earthly, but not Jesus. He comes from above. He comes from heaven. His words, his life is heavenly. It's a statement of Jesus' preeminence. Philippians 2.9 tells us that God has highly exalted him. John continues, and what he has seen, I mean, he comes from heaven, and he's seen all the heavenly things, and what he's seen and heard, that's what he testifies. So I might testify of what I know as a prophet of, of earthly things, but Jesus, he's God, he's from heaven, and he speaks of things he's seen and heard from heaven. Man, that's powerful. John is essentially telling his disciples, listen, we're worlds apart. When it comes to me comparing me to Jesus, we're worlds apart, literally. Jesus said in John 8, 38, I speak what I've seen with my father. And again, as he says here, what he's seen and heard, he testifies. But here's the sad thing. Look at the end of that verse. And no one receives his testimony. That's an astonishing statement. Jesus came from heaven. He's seen all the heavenly things. He's seen what God has said. Speak what God has said. He is God. He's come from God. People rejected him. And people do that today. That's an astounding thing. Yet everything he says is absolutely true. In fact, it's certified by God. Verse 33, he who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. Jesus didn't receive his authority from men. He received it from God. And he's certified from God. That word certified, by the way, speaks just kind of how we think of it today. It actually spoke of a legal document, verified as official, and then affixed to it was an official stamp, an official seal. That's what it means. 
So what John is saying is this, Jesus is God's certified witness. In fact, because he is God, he speaks the very words of God, verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. John is saying, my words are earthly. I'm even a, a prophet of God. But when you hear Jesus speak, he's speaking the very words of God. That's why, remember, this takes us back to chapter one. At the very beginning, in the beginning was the word, speaking of Jesus, the divine logos. The word was with God. The word was God, right? Jesus is the word. John 6, 33, he says, the words I speak to you are spirit, they're life. And then he adds, for God does not give his spirit in measure or by measure. What does that mean? Well, in referring to Jesus, he didn't have a part or a bit or a small measure of the Holy Spirit as some men would have. No. In fact, can I give you a few verses just to speak of what Jesus had being a man filled with the Spirit? Jesus was conceived by the Spirit, Matthew 1.20, filled with the Spirit, Luke 4.1, baptized by the Spirit, Matthew 3.16, led by the Spirit, Matthew 5.1, anointed by the Spirit, Luke 4.18. And there are many other passages. Jesus, as being 100% man, was filled, led, saturated, anointed by the Holy Spirit in full measure, like no one else. And then being 100% God, He's one with the Spirit because he is God. So what John is doing, he's honoring the person of Jesus Christ. He's putting himself down. It's not about me. This is how great Jesus is. And then he says, the Father loves the Son, verse 35, and has given him all things, all things. He's got it all. When you read Psalm 2, and this is a good psalm to read on your own, it speaks of what the Father has given the Son. Let me just read to you one verse, Psalm 2.8. The Father is saying, ask of me, and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possessions. That's what Jesus has. Let me read to you Philippians 2, 9, all the way to verse 11. You're familiar with it. This is how exalted and honoring Jesus is. God has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. All things. That's all authority, all truth, all knowledge, all glory, all supremacy. It's all. So in verses 31 to 35, John is honoring Jesus by declaring his supremacy. So he tells his disciples quite plainly, don't look to me. Don't be jealous for me. He's it. It's all about him. He's the Messiah. He's God. Surrender your life to him, ladies and gentlemen, is what he's saying to his disciples and saying to us. And that's why his final words are words of hope, are words of hope. Really, he concludes with an invitation in verse 36. In light of all that he stated, he says, now he who believes in believes in in the Son. It's all about Jesus. And if you will believe in him, the Messiah, the living God, you will have everlasting life. But he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God will abide on him. So John concludes this section by telling his disciples, listen, not only shouldn't be jealous of him, you need to follow him. He's the Messiah. Surrender your life to him. You can have everlasting life. John here to his disciples and really the Holy Spirit to us is giving us an invitation much like Moses did. When you get to the last book of the the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, you get to Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19, as Moses is saying farewell, as they're about to come to the promised land, this is what he says to him. I have set before you, everybody, life and death, blessing, cursing, choose life. That's what what Moses said. That's what John is saying here to these men and to us. Choose Jesus, choose life. He who has the Son has everlasting life. But notice the key, he who believes. That's not just an intellectual understanding. Oh, yeah, I, I get it. I understand that. No, no, no. It's a full reliance. It's a full trust. In fact, the word believe means to put your full weight upon. It's like if you've ever gone skydiving, there comes that point when you're up the plane at 10,000 feet. It's a perfectly good plane, and you're going to jump out of it. That's what it is. That's what that word believe is. I believe it's an exhilarating experience, by the way, if you've never done it. But better than that, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times better than that is taking a step of faith to follow Jesus Christ. You want a thrill of a lifetime in this lifetime and the life to come? Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. It's a a quality of life right now, new life right now, and then a quantity of life, whoo, forever, everlasting life. I like that. And why do you want to do that? Because he who doesn't believe in the Son, you won't see life. You won't have that life, but rather the wrath of God abides on him. Notice it's already there. 
Why is that? Uh, let me tell you. Because Adam and Eve sin, sin is now passed down to every single human being. We know that because we see that in our kids. You don't teach your children to lie, to cheat, to say something bad, do wrong. You don't teach them that. Now, here's how you do something bad. No, they do it all on their own, very naturally. Why? Because they're sinners, as we're sinners. And our parents before us and grandpa, they're all we're sinners. And the Bible says that the wages of our sin is separation from God. It's, it's part of our life. Now, here's what Jesus said in the same chapter in verse 18, Jesus' own words. He who believes in me won't be condemned. If you believe in me, you won't be condemned. But if you won't believe in me, you're condemned already. Jesus didn't come to the world to condemn the world, but the world's condemned already. Why? Because of our sin. So he said, here's what's gonna happen. You're condemned. The wrath is on you because of sin. So here's that. I'm the antidote. Surrender your life to me. Believe in me. Trust in me. I'll take care of it. How did you do that? At the cross. I took all of your sin upon me at the cross, paid the penalty, died, rose again. So God's desire is not that anyone would experience wrath, but everlasting life. He tells us that in 1 Timothy 2.4. He wants everyone to be saved. Every single person can have the hope of heaven, the hope of eternal life. Man, that's my biggest prayer for everyone here. You say, well, what do I need to do to have that? Can I wind up just our time talking about that? I want to because... Maybe you're here and, and you've been away from the Lord for a while. Maybe you're not even sure you are saved. Or we know you're not. Well, first of all, it means that we have to repent of our sin. We have to acknowledge that we sin. I don't think that's hard for anybody to acknowledge that, to be honest. If we're honest, we, we sin. We all know that. So what does repentance mean? It means to turn around. The word repent means make a U-turn. It's kind of like when you're on a freeway. It's happened to me so many times, especially the older I get. You know, you're driving down the freeway, you miss your off-ramp. You're either listening to music or talking to somebody. Ah, I missed the road. So what do you do? You get off the next off-ramp and you turn around. You were going the wrong way. Now you start going the right way. That's what repentance is. I recognize I'm a sinner. I'm doing my own thing the way I want to do it. Repentance says, I'm sorry, God. I'm going to turn and do it your way. But you also need to believe. We, we talked, it says he who believes, Right? Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised from the dead, you can be saved, putting that full weight upon, that full trust in Jesus Christ. You have to be willing to do that, are you? Well, I want to give you an opportunity, but let me say this before we do that. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. I think one of the temptations for us is like, I heard you, preacher. I've heard that before. Or, yeah, I got it. Or maybe next week. Maybe sometime in the future. Maybe I'll come back. Maybe tomorrow. Listen, tomorrow is the devil's word. Because Satan whispers in your ear, and he says, you know, you hear, tomorrow. But what he re really means is, never, don't. And what happens is, especially in the United States, I doubt that anybody here in this room has never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I doubt that. So what happens is this, we get gospelized. Maybe you hear it better packaged, and maybe it's, you're hitting, it's resonating with you. I hope it is. Because what happens is this. Jesus said this in John 3, 20. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. So I stand at the door and I knock. That's our heart. He's knocking our heart. And if any man hears my voice, you're hearing the truth and opens the door. That's faith. You're saying, okay, God, come into my heart. He says, I'll come in. I'll change your life. But here's what happens when we resist the gospel. It's like there's another laminate that gets put on that door. And Jesus knocks again another time. Knock, knock, knock. knock. And you hear it. And you're like, I'm not going to respond. And then another laminate coat goes on it. And you hear it. And and what happens is year after year after year after year, that door is coated so much when you hear the gospel that Jesus is knocking, but you can barely hear it. You don't hear it anymore. Why? You become gospelized. You become anesthetized. That's a very dangerous place to be. So listen, if God is peeking through all that by the Holy Spirit and he's saying, listen, you need to repent of your sin and believe in me and follow me, do it. Don't put it off. You don't have the guarantee of tomorrow. None of us do. But today you can. Today you can have new life in Christ and have a whole new beginning. You go, why did I put that off for so long? Right? We had a gentleman up here got baptized, right? I don't know how old he is, but, you know, he's at least in his 50s, 60s. I don't know. And he said, I've heard you on the voice, man. I'm following Jesus. That's what it's all about. Be willing to turn your life to Jesus today. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint, who is making his way through the Gospel of John. In this gospel, Jesus makes several divine claims about himself. For example, in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is claiming that he is the only way to God. There is no other way or person who can get you into heaven. 
This goes against our culture today, which believes that there are many ways to go to heaven, or that all good people go to heaven, no matter who or what they believe. What do you believe? If you have any questions or want to talk about anything you heard today, we'd love to hear from you. Please reach out to us at 281-648-5800. Again, that number is 281-648-5800. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint. If you're in the Friendswood area, why don't you join us in person? You can find our location and service times at ltlradio.org. If you can't make it in person, we highly recommend downloading our mobile app as well. The Larger Than Life podcast is available to stream from the podcast link, or you can subscribe from your favorite app so you never miss an episode. We hope you'll join us next time for another message from Larger Than Life.